Wednesday we looked at the first 16 verses of chapter 17 and and saw some of the travels of Paul and and um, some of the problems that were had in Thessalonica and then they went to Berea and uh, things start off well there but again the Judaizers when they find out what is going on uh, that, that Paul is preaching the Lord Jesus Christ and they don't like it and so they 
uh, again go down there and start trouble so the disciples there send Paul away and he ends up in Athens Greece and so as we ended last Sunday or I'm sorry last Wednesday uh, in verse 16 it says now while Paul waited for them in Athens his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry and uh, I read the statement again in another uh, book that I was looking at that uh, back in that day uh, you would run into an idol quicker than you would run into a person in that city. That's how many idols they had in that city. And even if you go to Greece today, there are the ruins of some of those great temples that were set up for some of those uh, false gods that were there that uh, some of the remnants of them are still there uh, that you can see today and so uh, you can even go online and look at pictures of those and realize these were the things that Paul was looking at while he was talking to the people at Athens Greece uh, and preaching to them and so as we continue in verse 17 it says therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. And so again, we see, you know, every time he goes somewhere, he goes to the synagogue first. We, uh, we read the scripture uh, where Paul said to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. So we always went to the Jews. Why? Because again, <clears throat> that was God's chosen people that were supposed to be his priest. They were to go out and share the message. And so, uh, again, he is going to them first. But what is different here is if you go back and look at the beginning of chapter 17, uh, in verse 4, it says some of them believed when he went to the synagogue. And then uh, you go on into Berea, verses 10 and 11, he uh, preached in the synagogue. And verse 12, it says many of them believed. And so uh, along with some of the Gentiles, uh, that would listen, that were believer of the God of the Jewish people, but were not proselytes, and so they too accepted the message. But here in 17, we see something different. It doesn't tell us what the outcome of his preaching. It doesn't tell them, us that some believe <clears throat> or that many believe uh, of any of them there in the synagogue. It does go on in verse 18. It says there were certain philosophers of the, of the Epicureans and of the Stoics and they encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Others some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers were there, uh, which were there, spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. And so, again, we see that uh, there are some philosophers because Paul is traveling around. Uh, uh, once things don't work at the synagogue, what does he do? <clears throat> he goes to the market daily. So they have a market area. And um, I guess the closest thing maybe we uh, could compare it's like one of these big farmers markets or something where you would go down and there's people going around and buying and selling or maybe you've seen video of some of these uh, third world countries we'd say and they have big marketplaces where they sell a little bit of everything and it's just kind of open market out in the street and people have booths so that that type of area is what would so he goes in there and he's preaching and so some of these philosophers uh, hear him and uh, so we have two different we have the Epicureans and we have the Stoics and so um, the Epicureans uh, they believe that pleasure or happiness is the chief good in life and so they were devoted to pleasure and comfort and high living but without going overboard with it they just wanted to uh have a pleasant life and have things to be pleasurable but not with getting too carried away with it uh, so they say uh, they also wanted to eliminate the fear of god and the fear of death and so that was the epicureans and so uh they were kind of similar to the sadducees Again, the Jewish Sadducees, they uh, didn't believe in life after death. They just believed that you lived this life and that was it. And so the Epicureans were kind of the same uh, 
with that. Um, and then you had the Stoics, and uh, they uh, had an ethic of duty. And uh, so in modern thought, they are somewhat indifferent to play, pain, pleasure, or grief or joy. So they just repress their feelings or endure things patiently. And so you can say somebody is stoic, that just means they have no reaction whatsoever. And so these people tried to, tra tra yeah, tried to train themselves to be Stoics, and that philosophy still exists today. There are people that call themselves Stoics today. Um, they also were kind of like pantheists. Uh, pantheism is the belief that uh, we believe that God exists everywhere. They believe God exists in all things. So God exists in the trees. God exists in the flowers, and so that's pantheism. And we don't believe that. We believe he's everywhere, but not in everything. Um, and so that is what the Stoics uh, believe. And uh, again, they're kind of along the lines of the Pharisees. So they're uh, more about uh, keeping the law and about being strict with things. Um, and they, again, believed in a multitude of gods, but um, uh, again, different than what we would believe. So this is the two groups. So again, Paul's in kind of a similar situation just as he was with the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He's just dealing with Gentile people. And so uh, it says that these philosophers encountered him and some said, what will this babbler say? And so it was, what's he going on about? And uh, so it's almost like he's just uh, talking nonsense to them a little bit, if you would. Now, now, a lot of these people consider themselves highly educated and above other people. And so here's this Jewish man that's coming and teaching them something they've never heard before. And so it's like, what, what's he talking about? What, you know, what's going on here with this guy? And so he, uh, another one says he seems to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And so a lot of these people, especially the Epicureans, they did not believe in a resurrection. They just believed you lived this life, you died, and that was it. Everything was over and done with. And then the Stoics kind of, I believe they were along the lines of you just kind of become part of the universe when you die, become part of the Greek logos which is different than the Logos as John discusses the Lord Jesus Christ in John 1.1. And so uh, they go on and say uh, in verse 19, it says they took him and brought him unto the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new doctrine where thou speakest is. And so what is going on here? Now, when you first read that, and I've read that for a long time, that these people are like, hey, we're curious. Why don't you come on down here, and we're going to get the guys together, and then uh, you sit and tell us what's going on. But that's not the case at all. I mean, they're, they're, it's almost as if he is on trial. Uh, one thing you didn't do in Greece, they had a lot of gods, but you didn't just come down there introducing any old god to them. They had their gods. You know, Zeus was it and then you know on and they had their gods and you, you didn't come in introducing these different gods and so they say you, you need to come down if you will they're saying come down and explain yourself to us you need to explain more about what you're talking about but again they give it an audience of course we know that God has something to do with this again but thou bringest strange things to our ears, and we would like to know what these things mean. And again, now imagine these people are philosophers, so what do they do all day? They sit around there and they talk about stuff. I mean, that's their life. They sit around and they debate stuff. And they, they uh, somebody comes up with something new, then they hear that thing, and they, they, they debate it. And again, uh, things can get by. Some of their own philosophers they didn't care for very much. They brought them to Mars Hill to explain themselves. And if they didn't like the explanation, it didn't go well for them uh, in a lot of cases. And so again, uh, they called Paul down to, to uh, tell them this thing so that they could hear something new. So again, Paul, hey, Paul takes the opportunity. So what does he do? He goes in there and in verse 22, it says, Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill. And what did he say? Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Now this almost sounds like an insult, but he's not insulting them. What he's doing, he's actually kind of giving them an offhanded 
well, I wouldn't call it a compliment per se, but he just kind of, uh, he's not, he's trying to tell them, I, I see you're, you're in the worshiping gods. Okay, I, you got a lot of idols around. I, I see you, you guys are into this idol thing, okay? So it's not so much that he's, he's um, uh, making fun or making sport of them. He's just making a statement. You know, y'all are really uh, into worshiping these idols and all. And in verse 23, he says, listen, as I passed by and beheld your devotions, in other words, all your altars and everything you went through, uh, I saw an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. And so, again, they don't particularly like you coming in uh, and discussing uh, new gods and things. So Paul looks and sees an offer to an unknown God, and he goes, okay, I'm not introducing a new God. I'm telling you about this unknown God. Now, why in the world does somebody have an altar to an unknown God? Because, boy, you want to make sure you cover all the bases, right? I mean, you got your God for agriculture, and you got your God for rain, and you got your God for sun, and you got your God to have children, and uh, you got all these different gods you work, but, boy, you don't want to upset the gods. You want to make sure you got them all covered, so let's just make one to the unknown God in case we missed one. And so that's why they have this altar to this unknown God. And so Paul sees that and he says, hey, this is the God I'm here to tell you about. And by the way, this is the true God. This is the one God. This is the living God. This is the only, out, out of everything here, the God I'm going to tell you about is the real deal. Amen. And so that's what he's describing. So he goes on and says, uh, again, you, you have no idea what you're doing, but I'm declaring him unto you, verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. So again, imagine Paul is standing at Mars Hill, and there's the temple of Mars, and there's the Parthenon, uh, these big, uh, again, temples there where they worship these false gods, and then there's all these other idols that are worshiping. And he's going, listen, uh, this God is not to be worshiped in these temples. Now, again, these people didn't believe in a God that kind of created everything. Or, Well, some of them, again, believed that God created everything, and then he just left and said, y'all figure it out. I'm, I'm done with you. I created you. I gave you a world. Whatever y'all do is what y'all do. And there are people that believe that today. Yeah, there's probably some uh, creator somewhere. He just created us and went on about his business, went out and do other things, and whatever happens, happens. And so some of them believe that. Some of them just believe the world kind of always has been. And again, you, you've got some of those. Out. Well, it's just always existed. And so Paul was telling them, listen, this God made the world and everything that is therein. And he is one God that is God of heaven and earth. And he doesn't need all these temples to dwell in. That's right. I mean, you think about it. Even uh, remember when um, King David uh, wanted to build a temple for the ark. He said, you know, I, I've got this palace, man. You know, I, it's nice. And the ark of the covenant is still in a tent. So I need to build something. So you remember Nathan the prophet said, yeah, David, go ahead. And then God came to Nathan and said, no, 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 you tell him no. When have I ever asked for a temple? Mm. So I've never asked for a temple. But then he went on and said, you let the son build a temple. But again, it's under God's conditions, not man's conditions. God made those determinations. Right. Here's how the temple held it. You know, it's the same thing with the tabernacle uh, out in the wilderness. God made the determinations. He told them how to build everything, how to do everything, and he is the one that determined when things would happen. You know, again, what would happen? They would get to a spot. Remember, they had a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. They guided them, and so when the pillar, uh, whichever one it was, day or night, stopped, then they set up camp, and they'd set the, the, the tabernacle up and set everything up. They might be there for one day. They might be there for months. Right. And then when God decided, they'd pick up and they'd move to the next place. 
And so he's telling them, listen, it's not for you to decide to build. God doesn't live in these temples. He, he doesn't, and even in the temple in Israel, he didn't live there. What did he do? He just had the Ark of the Covenant uh, for them to go in and again, sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. And, the, uh, and when they were in the tabernacle, what did he do? He came down to speak to Moses. But remember, they, the Bible tells us that he spoke to Moses as a man speaks to his friend face right. to face. Right. Again, who was that? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He came down and spoke to Moses face to face. So, and even then, he, he didn't live there. He just came down. And so he's explaining all this. Uh, verse 25, neither is worshipped with man's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he gave life to all and breath and all things. So, if you've read any history at all, or if you've even watched some of these quasi-historical movies, or some of these movies that Hollywood has made, what's a lot of times, what do you see with the idols and all, what do people do? Even today, they still do it. They bring them food. Right, they, they, they'll cook some, so like in China and all, they'll cook them little cross buns and they'll take them and set them up there. They'll get a bowl of rice and they'll set up there in the temple or they'll bring food or again, animal sacrifice up there. Why? For the gods. Oh, we, we, we've got to bring food to the gods. We've got to take care of the gods. And, and, and Paul's saying here, the God, the real God doesn't need y'all. That's right. He, he doesn't need you to take care. He's taking care of y'all. Y'all, like I say all the time, y'all couldn't even take a breath if it wasn't for this gospel. That's right. You couldn't even walk around if it wasn't. You couldn't do anything if it wasn't for this God. He doesn't need your help at all. And so that's what Paul is explaining here. He, he doesn't need you. He gives life and breath and all things. He created all of this and gives us all of this and needs nothing in return. Um, you know, again, uh, um, looking at Greek mythology, it was, was not long ago we watched um, uh, Clash of the Titans. Now, you remember there was an old Clash of the Titans movie, and then they redid it, and we watched the redid re, re version. Um, because I'd never seen it, I'd seen the older one. And so, you know, we saw the same thing. You know, uh, Liam Neeson was Zeus, and, and, you know, they were mad because the people weren't bringing sacrifice and they weren't worshiping the gods like they didn't need the gods, and we got to do something about it. And, you know, and Hades came up, and, and it just, you know, but again, it's Greek mythology. Um, and so that's the kind of stuff that these people thought. Well, the gods need us to worship them. Like they draw strength from that or something. Mm -hmm. God doesn't draw strength from our worship. Mm -hmm. And so listen, this, God doesn't need the things y'all think the gods need. But then he goes on verse 26 and says, And hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and then to have determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Now again, these people here, they thought they were the master race. You know what Paul Stone? There is no master race. Right. God created all races. God created all mankind. All the races that exist on the earth today, God created. Right. That's right. God created all. And everybody came from one blood. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. You came, you're one That's blood, right. and that blood goes all the way back to Adam. I saw a thing on the news the other day. Uh, they were talking about DNA, and they said, you know, it's interesting, scientists have tracked DNA back to three women. DNA back to three women. That's amazing. We, we just don't know which three women it is. Well, I do. It's Shem's wife, Ham's wife, and Japheth's wife. Yeah. Hello. Because what happened? They got off the ark, and there were sons, and they went out, and they had kids, and yeah. on and on it went. So there's your three women that all the DNA, but oh, it ain't that Bible, so we can't have that. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, it all traces back to one woman, which is Eve. That's right. <laughs> And so all the blood comes from, now when did all this happen? Well, the Tower of Babel, right? 
God came down, they're trying to build this tower, and so he confused the languages. And so what happened? This one people group, they all the languages got confused, and so what did people start doing? They would start going around and talking their gibberish until somebody they found that's taught the same gibberish and them. Then they got together and went and found other people that taught that same, and then they finally started spreading out. And then, of course, you get in the areas they live in around the world, they get the pigmentation in the skin, and so on and on that goes until you have the various skin colors that's going, that right. go on. But God made all of them one blood. And all that dwell on the earth, and listen, have determined the times before appointed. In other words, Paul's saying, you know what? <coughs> God determined when you were going to be born. That's right. He knows when you're going to die. He determined that you were going to be born in Greece. All y'all are sitting here right now because God ordained for you to sit here right now. That's right. So he's telling them nothing's happened by accident. Nothing's happenstance. Nothing, you know, again, that's what you have to tell these people. <coughs> Nothing happened by chance. Now again, we go back to the old watchmaker thing, right? Hmm. I look at my watch, it says Casio Quartz. That tells me that there's a company made Casio, or named Casio, that made my watch. My watch had a maker. I didn't just walk around one day and see something in the ground and kick it a little bit and go, ooh, a watch, look at that. And it just created itself in the dirt. Any of y'all remember, I think it was when I first came here, I brought in a little plastic right. container that had a watch that I took apart. Yeah. And I put a date on it. And I'd shake it up every now and just try to help it out and get back together, you know, because <laughs> it wasn't doing very good by itself. According to evolution, as it should, I, everything was there it needed to put itself back together. I don't know what the problem was, but I even shook it up to help it. At some point when we moved, I found it and I went, well, huh, look at this. And I opened it up, it still wasn't together. <laughs> still all them little pieces I guess maybe evolution really does take millions of years I don't know <laughs> maybe a spring will get onto a little knob at some point in the next hundred thousand years I don't know but it sounds foolish to us there's people that believe that garbage yep. and so again just like Paul we have to tell them look, look around you there is too much order for it to just happen. There's too much order. And so Paul is explaining all this to them. And so again, you live here at this time because that's what God said. Go on to verse 27. Again, that they, talking about these nations, should seek the Lord. And so what, again, is the job of all nations were to seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. God is not far from every one of us. What does the Bible tell us? That God would that all men would be saved. Right. Amen. Right. And he's not far from any of us. I mean, God's not here right now going, well, Cedar Rock's having church service. I guess I'll pop in and then I got to jog over to Asia because they're having a church service over there here shortly. And, right? He's near us. And has that desire that we would all come to him. For in him, verse 28, again, messing up their theology, in him we live and move and have our being. Again, going back to the fact that the only reason that you're here, you're alive, you're talking, you're breathing is because of God. Amen. Only reason. That's it. And then he goes and quotes some of their own poets. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we're the offspring of God, we ought not think that the Godhead is like unto gold, silver, stone, graven by art, and man's device. Okay, so again, for as much then as we're the offspring of God, just as your poets said, we are his offspring. Now the poets are Aratus, 
and Epimendes. In other words, their own writers were seeking out the true God at one point in time. And then he says, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we're the offspring of God. Now how is everybody else? Now I've talked about that. I've preached about this before. He says, we're the offspring of God. Well, God created Adam. We all came from Adam. So in that sense, we're the offspring of God. That's right. But everybody today says we're all God's children. And that's not true. The Bible says those that belong to Christ God's children. So not all mankind is God's children. All are his creation. Right. But not all are his children. Right. And so in Romans chapter 8 verse 16 it says the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now does the spirit bear witness to people that aren't saved? Nope. It bears witness with us of what? We are the children of God. And in Romans 9 uh, verse 7 and 8 it says neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children but in Isaac shall thy seed be called that is they which are the children of the flesh these are not the children of God but the children of the promise are counted for the seed and so he's saying listen not all the Jewish people are the children of God just ones of the promise the ones that have believed God and trust, that's the real children. And then in Galatians 3.26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That's how you are a child of God, by faith in Christ Jesus. So that, again, he's explaining to him, yes, you are offspring of God, and yes, he is seeking you out. But he is not like this gold and silver or all these man's devices or all these idols. And it didn't hit me to just now, but, you know, Jeremiah talks about this. He, he almost laughingly says, uh, you know, what sense does it make? A man will cut a tree down. And he'll take some of that wood and he'll make a fire and he'll cook his food. And then with some more of that same wood, he'll carve an idol and bow down to it and worship it. Yeah. No, Jeremiah said, what kind of sense does that make? That's ridiculous. And so Paul's saying the same thing here. Listen, God's not silver. He's not gold. He's not in your idols. He's not in the wood. He's all these things you have around. God's not in these things. These are not God. You made these things. They are simply objects. And then he goes on verse 30 and says, In the times of this ignorance God <laughs> winked at, in other words, he overlooked, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. In other words, Paul is saying something has changed. Yeah. Yes, there was a time when all men looked at all these idols and all this there and but times have changed. Well, what changed? Jesus Christ came to the earth. That's right. He was born. He lived. He died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again three days later. Yes. Ascended to the right hand of the Father. And so now things are changed. God, yes, God overlooked that. But now he is telling you, you need to repent <coughs> and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. Yes. All this days of ignorance is over with. You have to make a decision. Why? Verse 31. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world. Now again, these people had no concept of a judgment that's coming. Again, for the most part, they thought you died and that's the end of it. Paul's saying, no, there's a judgment day coming to this world. Right. Judgment is coming. And he who, God, will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Well, who was that? Jesus. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. 
Now, I assure you that the message we're reading right now is not all that Paul said to these people. Mm. I'm sure the conversation was quite long. And so Luke has just given us a synopsis here. Given us some of the words that Paul has said, but again, I'm sure much more was said than this because we don't see the name of Jesus, but he's talking about Jesus, so at some point he's got to tell them Jesus. Because the Bible says there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So he's got to tell them about Jesus. Right. And that's who he's talking about. Again, he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. And he's given assurance unto all men, and then he has raised him from the dead. Again, you go to Revelation chapter 1. Jesus appeared to John. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I, I was dead, but now I am alive. And what did he say? Forevermore. Yes. And so God's given this man judgment, and he has raised him from the dead. Now, just like the Sadducees, you have the Epicureans that are, well, we don't believe in life after death. Well, not only is there life after death, but we have one that's come back from the dead. Hmm. And so, just like he did with them, he's really messing up their theology. And so, in verse 32, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed among them. In other words, what are they saying? All right, we've heard enough for today. Mm. Some of them went raised from the dead, please. Yeah. You ever heard that mockingly said today? Jesus raised from the dead. That's ridiculous. But some were like, hmm, this sounds kind of interesting. We'll hear again about this. But listen, how be it certain men clave unto him and believe. So some of them there did believe. Among the which was Dionysius, the Aeropagate, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. And so we have a few that are named and some others that did believe. But you know what's interesting? I don't recall reading about a church at Athens. Well, there were some believers there. And maybe it came about, well, we know it came about later on because, again, eventually we have the Greek New Testament. <coughs> but at this time, we don't see as at others, so they established a church and then went back and strengthened the brethren. You know, we don't read that stuff there. Good hint. So now, if we get nothing else out of this today, the one point that I think that we should get is that Paul deals with different groups of people. I mean, he deals with the Jewish people, he deals with the Gentiles, and uh, he dealt with the Thessalonians, he's dealing with the Greeks here in Athens, he dealt with others in different parts of the world. But no matter who he's dealing with at the end of the day, no matter what he's dealing with, with what they believe, what they don't believe, or whatever, it's always about Jesus. He always preaches Jesus. As a matter of fact, where is it in uh, in First Corinthians? Yeah, in First Corinthians chapter two, verses one and two. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. And I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. In other words, everywhere Paul went, how'd he go? Not in he, he wasn't charismatic like we see some of these preachers on TV today that just walk in and sweep people off their feet. His preaching was through the Spirit of God. Hmm. 
and the power of God. Paul says, I was trembling. <clears throat> By the Spirit of God, I preached. And what I preached, I didn't preach Paul. I didn't preach the Baptist church. I didn't preach the Methodist church. I preached Jesus Christ and him crucified. In other words, I preached Jesus. And that's exactly what we ought to do too. We ought to preach Amen. Jesus. When we go out and witness to people, and you know, I heard a preacher on the radio the other day and didn't even tie it into this till just now. But he was talking, he said, when I go out and deal with people and they start, you know, wanting to argue or bring up all these questions, you know, they could ask these stupid questions like, well, what can God create a rock that he himself can't live? That's just stupid. You know? He said, no matter what, just always turn it around back to Jesus. Always turn it around and preach Jesus. That's what Paul did. And we see the examples here throughout the book of Acts. He always preached Jesus, didn't matter who the audience was, didn't matter what was going on. Matter of fact, we're going to read it for too long. The Jews are going to get mad at him. The Romans are going to come in and arrest him. And he quiets everybody down so he can talk to them. And what does he do? He preaches Jesus. Amen. And then they get mad at him again and want to kill him. So Paul has set the example for us, and we need to do the same as well, irregardless of who we're dealing with and what they believe. Let's just preach Jesus. Not saying it's going to turn out good every time. Again, uh, Paul had a lot of times where nothing good happened, but he got beat up or stoned or whatever. But there's other times when many believe, and you never know when you might just plant that seed or might that's be right. planted to get the water a little bit. That's right. And so that's what we're encouraged to do. All right.